Hello, good evening to all of you. Uh, I am Vikas Verma, former assistant advocate journal and co-chairman of All India Learners Forum. So on behalf of All India Learners Forum, I welcome to all of you. And we have the chief guest, Justice Kurian Joseph, retired judge Supreme Court of India. We have eminent speaker, R. Venkat Ramani, senior advocate, Supreme Court of India. We have with Siddharth Vatra, advocate on record and former additional AG Haryana. And we have with Aljo K. K. Joseph, advocate on record and member EC Skora. So I may request to Siddharth Vatra, sir. And sir, sorry, we have with the Vinod Kumar Goel chairman, All India Lawyers Forum. So now may I request to Siddharth Vatra ji, kindly give the welcome note in respect of our guest. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time to join today's webinar on professional ethics. As Verma ji told that I'm an advocate record. I'm a partner with Satram Das BN Company. I, on behalf of All India Lawyers Forum, I'm elated to welcome all of you to this webinar. As uh, in our profession, in our legal profession, sometimes we say that action speaks louder than words. Our action and words in this case have an effect not just on ourselves, on the people around us. Many of the professional decisions which are driven by the beliefs, ethics and values we have learned over the years. As, as in this legal profession, I believe we have a twin duty one duty towards the court and one duty towards our client. In saying so, our duty towards the client and the court, I believe that professional ethics become very important to safeguard, protect and promote our profession, our clients and our own personality. And now just to give a brief about the All India for Lawyers Forum, I must say it is the foremost organization for national level practitioners, bar association, and law societies established in 2009. It was born out of the conviction that an organization made up of the bar associations could contribute to national stability and peace through the administration of justice. In the ensuing years yeah, since its yeah. creation, the organization has involved from an association comprising exclusively of bar associations and law societies to one that incorporates individual national lawyers and entire law firms. The present membership is comprised of more than 10,000 individual national lawyers from most of the leading law firms. During lockdown, AILF has conducted a lot of seminars on different topics. Today, we have the retired judge of the Supreme Court, a oh, man who needs oh. no introduction. I believe the favorite Supreme Court judge of the bar, Honorable Mr. Justice Curin. He was appointed as the judge of Kerala High Court in 2000 and was appointed as the Chief Justice of Marshal Pradesh High Court in 2013. And post that, he came to Supreme Court and ruled the members of the bar. A great judge, a great personality. Our Attorney General KK Venugopal KK Gopal said once that he's the nicest judge. And I believe none of our viewers can disagree with the fact. Siri Joseph began his career in 1979. He was a member of the Academic Council Kerala University from 1977 to 1978. He was the General Secretary of the Kerala University Union in 1978, a Senate member of the Cochin University from 1983 to 85, member of the Board of Studies, Indian Legal Thought of Mahatma Gandhi University in 1996, President Kerala Judicial Academy from 2006 to 2008, Chairman of Kerala High Court Legal Services Committee from 2006 to 2009 and Chairman of Lakshadi Legal oh, Services oh. Authorities in 2008. Before becoming a judge, he was a government leader in 1987 and an additional advocate general from 1994 to 1996. He became a senior advocate oh, oh. in 1996. We have another great personality with us today, Shri Ven R. Venkat Ramani senior advocate, 40 years in the legal profession. And I think in my personal view, as well as the view of the other uh, members here present also, I do not think so. We have any other lawyer who has more knowledge about the subject professional ethics today. We are delighted to have him as well. He has been a member of the Law Commission of India. He's spoken at the 
highest stages of the world. One of them is yeah, United yeah, Nations yeah, at yeah. Geneva. Uh, Sh Sri Venkat Ramani started his career from Puducherry, a beautiful French city. Yeah, yeah. He did his law from Government Law College, uh, Puducherry, in 1979. Before 1979, he was working with a textile uh, mill. In 1979, he left the job to practice at the Madras High Court. But after that, he was called to Delhi. He remained uh, in the chambers of Shri, late Shri P. P. Rao, another stalwart who is not with us today. And Shri Venkat Ramani, in fact, has had a lot of publications which he has written. He has written a lot of books. He has co-authored a book in Tamil language on land reforms. He has authored a book on the judgments of justice. O Chinappa Reddy authored the volume on torts in the series of Holsbury Laws of India, published articles on constitutional law, and he's been involved in other major legal activities as such. He's been a guest faculty at the National Law School as well. If I continue telling what he has done, I believe I'll take most of the time. Uh, even, in fact, I've had the privilege of attending Sri Venkat Ramani's lecture earlier as well when I appeared for the examination. I found out the knowledge which Sri Venkat Ramani has, not uh, only uh, qua professional ethics as how uh, it is professional ethics in India, but the multi different jurisdictions of the world. I believe we have no other like him and it is our utmost pleasure to welcome him uh, for this webinar as well. I would also like to welcome Mr. Vinod Kumar Goel, Chairman AILF, Mr. Vikas Verma, Co-Chairman AILF, Mr. Abhinav Singh, President AILF, and my colleague LGO Joseph. Uh, to all my uh, friends, all the uh, viewers who are here, we have one instruction that if you have any questions, those questions can be posted in the comment yeah, box. Yeah. We'll take the questions at the end of the session, and we will try to accommodate everybody possible in the shortest period of time that we had. Now, without much ado, may I now begin with a favorite, a favorite judge, Honorable Mr. Justice Kuren Joseph. Thank you, Siddharth. A very good evening to one and all participating in this webinar. I'm extremely delighted to have this uh, webinar where Mr. Venkat Ramani, my good friend, is uh, also a co-speaker. And I congratulate uh, this All India Lawyers Forum and this office by race, particularly Mr. Vinayat Kumar, Goyal, Vikas, Batra, Aljo, Singh, and all those uh, other office by race in having thought of a um, thought of a noble venture and novel venture as well, whereby you can utilize your time effectively particularly in this uh, pandemic period. It keeps you connected and gives me a great joy also to see some of the familiar faces. It gives me an added pleasure in um, addressing you, my dear um, good lawyer friends. And also I can see a lot of students are also participating, budding lawyers. Yes, because I see a great future um, in all of you. I see. I say this because, uh, according to me, this uh, hands of the lawyers, where lawmen become silent, society is in trouble. According to me, the root cause of uh, many troubles that we see in society is the neutrality or the indifference or the silence which uh, our um, low what you call legal legal fraternity has chosen to whatever may be the reason these are trying times where we know in the interest of society forgetting our own personal interest our own um, party's interest our own community's interest our own um, what you call interest of uh, any group that we are all part of. But think of a society at large. 
because we are fortunate to be part of a great country it is our country we say we the people of india no it's my country it's our country this country belongs to us and i have a space and i have a voice in this country if i have a space i must occupy that space if i have a voice i must raise that voice when it is required if you don't do either of this is actually a, a a great sin that we commit to the to to the to the generations because uh, these are uh, trying times in history where we need to wake up and uh, think of a great country irrespective of politics party community religion sex language gender region and water position water i say this because we are people who know law and what is law law tells us what is actually the proper order that is conceived by the constitution of india built on great uh, pillars you know of uh, sovereignty socialism secularism democracy and being in a republic country and where we believe that we have justice that is economic social and political equality of status and opportunity liberty of um, thought expression faith belief and worship and fraternity where it is assured that every individual has uh, his dignity and his dignity will be protected and the country's uh, integrity and sovereignty will be safeguarded it is this can, this great country that we all belong to so i just took those three or four minutes now only to say that if we the law men of this great country are not able to think beyond and think above all these petty things and be at the service of nation to guide the nation to 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 correct the people to lead our community of uh, the people or the fraternity or the society which we all of us belong to well history will not pardon us i just wanted to remind all of you this at least let us lawyers think about all those things the only reason you know, to, to me i believe you know we study law and as a man as a citizen as a citizen irrespective of his wealth health party position religion region sex language what of it is it is to this great dream that we must all you know uh, level that we should rise and unless the lawyers are able to think about all these petty things and be at the service i must say selfless service for the nation there is no point in saying that you know we have been part of this country we have been part of this country not to read history but to create history you can create history only if you leave footprints and you will be able to leave footprints only if you walk in history not not not, not to, to to be to be secured in your own selfless uh, pools or places or indras so let's forget about everything else and think of a great country india is my country it's a great country and all indians are my brothers and sisters and that is the first ethical principle i wanted to tell you all about uh, my country our country my constitution our constitution which is the holiest of the holiest books as far as the citizen is concerned so let's all belong to a country and then belong to anything else first we belong to the country then all indians are my brothers and sisters for 12 years in the assembly we have uh, sung this we have taken this pledge in this my country all indians are my brothers and sisters but are we truly able to see others are our brothers and sisters 
I'm sorry, three C's actually kill us. One is casteism, communalism, and corruption. All these three things have divided us. So let's think about this. Now, let's love people. No, love people who are learned people. Let's think about all these small things and uh, see all people as our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Let me come to the um, professional ethics. We belong to a profession, not an employment. And this profession is uh, always seen and always uh, held as a noble profession and uh, is always taken as a service. And this is one service which is exempted from the <laughs> GST. Don't forget that. Only two professions have been exempted. One is ours, other is medical. All others of are covered by GST because this is the uniqueness of this great profession. Well, what is this ethics? What is the meaning of ethics? Unless we understand this ethics, there's no point in dealing with the professional ethics. Ethics uh, relate a person's or group's behavior. It's a code of a, a set of principles of uh, a person's or a group's behavior and moral principles and what is moral moral means it is concerned with the principles of right and wrong and the goodness and badness of human character so right and wrong behavior goodness and badness of uh, a human character this is the moral side of a person and uh, such moral principles if we codify, it's called ethics. And those principles, if we come to our profession, it is called our professional ethics. Every profession has its own um, code of conduct, ethical uh, code. We have a very elaborate uh, ethical code. Uh, and uh, before I uh, proceed uh, anything further into details, I just want to remind you that ours is the only profession only profession in the country where you know the regulator expects sex not only the regulator regulator is the bar council of india and the rules made by it actually been approved by the government of india so therefore the the society expects us what's expectation of the society of our uh, of a lawyer that is available in the bar council of india rules uh, governing the advocates it's in chapter two standards of professional conduct and etiquette. In fact, it could be ethics, not etiquette, ethics. So in that, there's a preamble. That preamble is very important according to me. It is this, this preamble, in fact, I'm um, requiring your attention. You must, uh, even if you are called at midnight, you must be in a position to tell this. Like, uh, you know, the, the um, Say Article 14. Every lawyer, you know, even if uh, uh, equality before law, equal protection of laws, um, liberty, preamble, just as the preamble says. Likewise, you know, this any lawyer uh, who is in practice should remember this. An advocate shall at all times comfort himself in a manner befitting his status as an officer of the court, a privileged member of the community and a gentleman this is what i wanted to say i have not seen any other uh, definition of a professional man qualifying him as a gentleman this is the only profession where uh, a lawyer is always seen and defined as a gentleman bearing in mind that what may be lawful and moral for a person who is not a member of the bar or a member of the bar in his non-professional capacity may still be improper for an advocate. So an advocate is 24 into 7. <coughs> 24 into 7. He's not actually uh, an officer of the court and leaving it there. He is seen by the society with a lot of uh, expectations. So what is ordinarily permissible for uh, an, uh, an ordinary citizen? will still be impermissible for a lawyer because you know what is law. 
principles governing the conduct of a person in society. It is actually meant to prevent disorder in the uh, one sense and the second sense it is meant to create order in society. So once you know what is required uh, uh, to create order and prevent disorder, then you should be in a position to, to meticulously and scrupulously follow that conduct because you are a, a very, very privileged member of the community as a lawman. That's why, you know, lawyer has been, a lawyer is respected everywhere. The moment your emblem sees, you know, not because of where uh, they are afraid of you, but they are respected because you are, or we are uh, at least presumed to know that we know law. And we are ruled by law. If we know law, that means we should be ruled by law. That's more important. There's no point in knowing law and not following law. So following law is actually the most important aspects. And that is expected in a greater measure from lawyers. And we must follow law. And only if we follow law, we can lead others to law. Be it a client, be it a witness, be it that is our great uh, privilege of the position in society. This is um, the, 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 the mainly I wanted to uh, invite your attention. And according to me, six statutes generally govern uh, our professional ethics, since you're all preparing for AOR exams also. I must just uh, refer to that. One is generally, of course, the Advocates Act, then the Bar Council of India Rules, Content of Courts Act, Supreme Court Rules, Supreme Court Rules on Content, then Legal Service Authorities Act. All these six statutes uh, generally cover uh, the expectations on the society from the lawyers and uh, govern the conduct of a lawyer uh, in, uh, in the court and in society. And uh, as far as Advocates Act is concerned, you know, you, your, um, our uh, right to practice uh, comes under uh, Section 29 and 30. And the moment you become a lawyer, you become a professional. Uh, the moment I became a judge, I ceased to be a professional because then I became a different status. So from 20, uh, 2000 to 2018, November, I was not a My license was otherwise. Uh, okay. From 18 November, I am back into profession now. So I am an arbitrator now. I am a mediator now. I am a consultant now. So I am back in my profession. So now I am given by the professional principles. And of course, uh, the, the position which I held uh, as a judge uh, in the Apex uh, Court of India and in my other capacities also. So being in profession, we always have to keep this uh, uh, ethical and moral principles which govern actually not only your conduct, the impact uh, which your conduct may have in society as well. So you are a man of law. That's most important. Now, this uh, permission comes under Section 29, uh, read with the Section 30. And uh, designation comes, of course, under the markers in the rules, also just doesn't matter to this. And now, regulator. Now, something about the regulator. The regulator uh, is actually conceived in the Advocates Act uh, under Section uh, 7, where the Bar Council of India function is uh, preferred to. Bar Council function is to lay down standards of professional conduct and etiquette for advocates. So deriving from that only this, uh, uh, what you call the, the Bar Council of India rules have been uh, promulgated. From where I read uh, the preamble. And this Bar Council of India rules uh, speak uh, uh, generally or rather in detail, exhaustively about our duties. Once uh, we have our rights under the Act as to practice under uh, in, uh, in terms of our Section 29 and 30, to be a privileged member of the society, to be a gentleman, and to have a right to uh, uh, plead for uh, anybody under Section 30, including the Supreme Court of India. Bar Council is an yet uh, to uh, uh, frame its uh, new policy as to whether there should be some restricted entry to Supreme Court, but your right to practice from Supreme Court of India to, to all the tribunals where it is not excluded. 
After that, you have a right. Then you have a duty also. Just as we have fundamental rights under Part 3 and fundamental duties under Part 4A, we, um, uh, we, we have a set of rights and a set of duties also. And uh, as far as uh, this professional we must go to the, the, the duties part. So there, again, there are four Cs and one O. Only five things. Just since I'm talking to you from the examination point of view, it's very easy to remember. There's duty to court, duty to the client, duty to the colleague, duty to the opposite counsel, and duty to others. So court, client, colleague, opposite counsel C, and duty to the society at large. So apart from being an uh, officer of the court, you have to see the, the maintain the professional standards and keep that etiquette, which actually is required of you in following all these uh, uh, duties to the five. Those duties are actually given in detail in the Bar Council of India rules. Uh, um, section one is duty to the court. Section two is duty to the client. Section three is uh, duty to the opponent. Duty uh, section four is duty to the colleague, and then generally is the duty to others also. You can read that in detail. I don't want to go into that because I'm sure you might have read it and you must be reading it also. And uh, there are been uh, situations where you know the uh, you, you cannot um, um, carry on any other profession along with this profession. Our regulator, Bar Council of India regulation, has been very clear about it. You cannot be partly in employment and partly a lawyer, no. Because you are meant to um, devote your complete time and attention. Because you are the spokesperson of your client. You have taken up the costs. Money is a different issue. But you are the spokesperson. That's why in court, you know, the client is not able to speak. You know, only the lawyer speaks. You are the lawyer, the, 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 the attorney, whom the power has been given to speak and plead cost and forward is take up take forward his cost. You are uh, uh, you are answerable thus in all other aspects also. So I don't want to go into the details as to whether um, uh, in such a situations of uh, duty, whether how much uh, this can take you forward. In the sense, you know, whether you can um, uh, hold your brief back. There have been a case where a lawyer uh, held back the brief for non-payment of fees. <coughs> Supreme Court said, no, you are not lean. Section 71 of the contract uh, does not apply here. So there have been many cases where um, all these principles have been discussed. And um, your rights are under five statutes, rather six statutes. And your duties are generally five. And uh, generally, ethics is uh, in the moral plane. And moral plane is sense of right and wrong. And uh, right and wrong conduct. And uh, goodness and badness of your own character. So I stop here. This is, in general, the professional conduct. Since Mr. Bengitraman is also there, I don't want to take uh, uh, more time because uh, we have some time for interaction also, though I have uh, um, the other uh, details where all these uh, case laws also have been discussed with regard to the professional conduct. I don't want to go into we'll see after Mr. Venkatramani also speaks. Thank you. All the best. God bless you and Jai Hind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lordship, for inaugurating this lecture series. This is the fourth lecture series on topic of professional ethics. So we had conducted the earlier three lecture series on advocate on record examination series. So now we have the uh, eminent key speaker, uh, senior advocate R. Venki Tamni sir. Kindly give your address on the topic, sir. Good evening to all. And first, my very sincere and respectful regards to Justice Kuri and Joseph. Uh, this uh, Joseph flagged a very important uh, dimension of a discussion for the day. He was talking about uh, this great nation. Now, I remember a, a story where we, the traditions of this country, including
including how generally things are ruled on the basis of righteousness. I always remember a story, a very small story in a Tamil epic about uh, a king who comes every evening to pray in the temple, comes to the temple one evening and lights the lamp. The lamps would not burn. He asked his minister, Mr. Minister, would I have done even unconsciously something which is wrong that the lights do not burn in the temple today? Unconsciously something which I have done wrong. That's the highest level of uh, rule by principles of righteousness. We have a very uh, difficult Sanskrit word called Dharma, difficult to encapsulate its meaning. But all our Indian languages have, in a manner of speaking, tried to capture the width and dimensions of this concept. So therefore, we are looking at the fundamentals of uh, human conduct, not in isolation, but in a community. And not human conduct as a mere participant in a social order, but as a participant in a, in a very exalted professional group. Now, before I talk more about that, I have a couple of preliminary observations to make. I thought it is important while we were talking about uh, the need of many lawyers who are preparing for their examination sooner or later. And I, as a head of the AOR committee in the Supreme Court, thought that we will not have an examination now, but we'll postpone it to December. But even so, when many would aspire from now on to keep preparing for, a, for an important turn in their professional career, I want to make some preliminary observations. Now, the study of law or the equipment of being a lawyer is not like simply making learning how to make a cup of coffee. The study of law has deeper dimensions. And in contemporary time, when you're talking about professional ethics, connection between morals and ethics, and all those very interesting dimensions, how regardless of centuries of professional ethics having been, you know, having, been, having evolved in almost all over, in all civilizations, you go back in point of time to Rome or Greece or, or later in, in uh, Middle England, you'll find the question of uh, a cause being represented by a person learned in law and principles of justice in an, in an impartial court. Is there a need to regulate the conduct of this person has been a vexing question. In contemporary times, neurosciences have started looking at where is the seat of morals. There are some studies which say different parts of our brain do different functions. So some part of our brain may deal with justice function, some part may deal with a with call rule making function or the rule function. Very interesting studies are being carried out. Someday we will know, unlike uh, 100 years ago when ascription of liability for somebody who has committed a rhyme was mostly in, in, in theoretical uh, foundations. We will soon reach probably a stage where the responsibility for one's conduct can be studied, evaluated on scientific principles. If that is so, the legal profession occupies a center stage in not only expanding the dimensions of knowledge, but also understanding how by such expansion, the legal profession will occupy a center stage in evolving a just social order. Now, we talk about professional ethics. We can talk at one level about the, you know, the exhaustive rules and codes of conduct laid on the Bar Council of India rules, or for that matter, in any part of the world, where every country has enacted set of rules governing the, or regulating the conduct of uh, legal professionals. 
at a different level, will be looking at the very role of a legal profession in, a, in, a, in the social order. Probably 100 or 200 years ago, when the legal profession played a very nominal role, a role, a minimal role in merely dispute resolution, acting on behalf of a person who could have afforded a service from that minimal role played by the legal profession, when we are today in a rule of law world, a world where majority of the nations have chosen to abide by constitutions, have chosen to abide by constitutional rule of law, even though the question as to what exactly rule of law may, may differ, because we have countries like the People's Republic of China, where they also say, we have a rule of law, but within the confines of the Communist Party of India, I mean, Communist Party of China. Therefore, if today we are in a stage where constitutional rule, rule of law, democracy, and those fundamental values have become part of our human psyche, I do not think that human beings in any part of the world where they have experienced and cherished liberty, freedom, and, and those uh, inalienable dimensions of the human mind where you think creativity and freedom are most important. Nobody will probably choose to give up constitutions, rule of law, freedom, democracy, and so on and so forth. As I said, they become part of our human psyche. Now, I just uh, proceed here to share a few reflections on, on how we have been looking at uh, the legal profession. I mean, the code of conduct, and how people have deviated from it, the kind of stories about deviations, lapses, and so on and so forth. I'll just quickly read a few uh, uh, quotes from, uh, because I think they make an interesting reading, and not because it's a story is about uh, the failures and lapses of the legal profession, but from how people have chronicled that the legal profession has, over a long period of time, has always been lapsing, in lapses in not being able to measure up to the high standards it has set for itself. These stories are important stories and lessons to be learned. I think the more I am engaged in reading, writing, and talking about professional ethics, the more I encounter the challenges of its relevance. Professional ethics is not merely about knowing some rules. The knowing how to make a coffee, as I said, I think it's a matter beyond utilitarianism and deeply connected with roles to be played by the profession in the larger social order. The subject is a perennial discourse, ever revolving around stories of lapses, misdemeanors, deviations, and the general fall from the codes of conduct. I will but briefly narrate what Professor Mark Gallanter calls the folklore about the legal system, the prevalent notion that the legal profession has fallen from an earlier condition of grace into an abject and debased condition. Quote, the lament that the profession has slided down in its standards is also a recurring theme. For instance, in the foreword written by Sir Maurice Gara, a former Chief Justice, the federal court, to K. V. Kishutswamaya's lectures on professional conduct and advocacy, published way back in 1940, reads thus, I quote, the standards on which the author insists are high and exacting, but neither too high nor too exacting for a profession which is an essential part of administration of justice. He concedes that of late the profession has, as he puts it, lost much ground, though he is unwilling to discuss the reasons which have led to this. That his statement is only true admits. I fear of no dispute and the value of books like this in which young men who are about to enter or who have just entered the profession are reminded of the duties and responsibilities of a lawyer is that they reassert standards sometimes in danger of being forgotten. I have heard Indian friends of my own themselves distinguish lawyers deplore in no uncertain terms this lawyering of standards. And it seems clear that one cause of it at least is the great overcrowding of the profession and the struggle for existence among its less fortunate members, since the weaker brethren are thereby exposed to temptations which they are not always able to resist. This is a matter which affects the public as well as the profession itself. 
for any diminution in the respect felt for lawyers as a whole must affect prejudicially the whole administration of justice. The story doesn't end. Uh, this is what was written in 1940. When Professor Anthony Cronman, writing in USA India 1993, titled his book, The Lost Lawyer, Failing Ideals of the Legal Profession. Chief Justice Warren Burger of the US Supreme Court in his lecture in 1995 observed thus, I quote, the legal profession has indeed moved away from long established traditions and canons of professional ethics. In 1970, a report from an American Bar Association Committee, chaired by a late colleague, Justice Tom Clerk, found the disciplinary action by Bar Association in response to professional misconduct by lawyers was practically non-existent. As a result of the marked increase in attorney misconduct and the failure of the organized bar to discipline violations, the standing of the legal profession is perhaps at its lowest ebb in the century and perhaps at its lowest in history. Anyone who wants who scans the writings of lawyers and judges on this subject and looks at the outrageous advertising of lawyers and television on billboards and in print will find abundant reasons for this low standing. I quote, then a former president of the American Bar Association, Stanley, in his lecture in the year 1989, was addressing the question of motivating relationship between professionalism and commercialization. He opined, I quote, when I use the word commercialism at the beginning of this address, and I refer to it as a motivating factor, I meant only the payment of compensation. Lawyers surely are entitled to be fairly paid for what they do. But what they do, because they are professionals, must always be guided by and what is good for the system of justice, the integrity of the judicial process and their personal integrity. Look at his words. If this is turned around and the primary goal of lawyers is to make money, then we are at a point 180 degrees from where we started. I quote. Then Anthony Cronin makes an important observation, which I only endorse, and that is, every profession is a job. Every professional makes a living by doing what she or he does. But not every job is a profession. Not every job is a way of life. The word profession suggests a certain stature and prestige. It implies that the activity to which it is attached possesses a special dignity the other professional's jobs do not. It is always appealing to me to quote him further. I quote, in the second chapter, I must say here that Anthony Cronman's book on Lost uh, Lawyer has been quoted a hundred times in several treatises, articles, discourses in USA and elsewhere. So let me quote him further. In the second chapter of The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith makes the famous observation that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Smith goes on to explain how each of these pursuing his business with an eye solely on his own advantage produces by means of an invisible hand an addition to the public good. With lawyers, it is different. Like the butcher, the brewer, or the baker, the lawyer also expects an income from his work. Like them, the lawyer generally is not motivated by benevolence to do what he does. But in contrast to Smith's tradesmen, it is part of the lawyer's job to be directly concerned with the public good, with the integrity of the legal system, with the fairness of its rules and their administration with the health and well-being of a community that the laws in part establish and in part aspire to create. We say that an officer, a lawyer is an officer of the court. What we mean is that lawyers like judges are bound by their position to look after the soundness of the legal system and must take steps to ensure its justice. Conscious, direct and deliberate steps, not those indirect and unanticipated ones that lead the butcher and his friends from preoccupation with their own advantage to the surprising and only 
unintended production of a public good. I quote, in an article published in the year 2002 in Journal of South Pacific Law relating to Australia, the author says, surveys tell, tell us that in terms of ethics and honesty, only building constructors, politicians, and car sale people have lawyer ratings than lawyers. In a study done in the United States, funeral directors rated more highly. The fact is that lawyers have been on the nose for a long time now. Part of this can be explained by the fact that the client sees the lawyers as the means to justice. And so, if they lose a case, be it criminal or civil, the lawyer and the system are easy targets of blame. Comprehensive codes of ethics do not by themselves guarantee ethical practice. This lies in the fundamental nature of being called to the bar. And there are very elevating words, being called to the bar. Fifty years ago, in the case of Inre John, so-and-so street chief justice observed, quote, it is to be borne in mind that the, all barristers are members of a profession as distinct from being engaged in a trade. A trade or a business is an occupation or a calling in which the primary object is the pursuit of pecuniary gain. Honesty and honorable dealings are, of course, expected from every man, whether he engage in a professional practice or in any other gainful occupation. But in a profession, pecuniary success is not the only goal. Service is the ideal, and the earning of remuneration must always be subservient to this main purpose. Now, today, the business of law focus uh, and say school deans and practitioners in big law firms on something else, maximizing immediate profits for their institutions. That has muddled the profession's mission and even worse, set it on a course to become yet another abject lesson in the perils of short-term thinking. Like the dot-com, like the real estate and financial bubble that have preceded it, the lawyer bubble won't end well either. But now the time to consider its causes, stop the growth and take steps that might soften the impact when it bursts. I was just, and Joseph was trying to explain ethics is an all compassing idea and conception. One can go to a religious text or a community tradition, ancient ethics, and even observed convention or behavior to collect our basket of ethics. Why is it not good enough to say that it is a general conception of ethics is complete and will be conveniently drawn as a reservoir? for professional conduct and behavior. Do we still need special set of rules and regulations specific to the legal profession? If so, is it merely a question answered by utilitarian concerns, namely the most, namely the most productive outcome for those who seek the assistance of the lawyer? Are there not other aspects of law, ends of justice, the idea of a constitution and the consequential promise that each one of us has given to ourselves into a community, to evolve into a community where liberty, autonomy, fairness, and all those highlighted, let us say, encompassed in the concept of dharma. I suppose any inquiry into professional ethic and responsibility will have to necessarily address these questions and perhaps may generate questions which may not have easy answers. Just as a study of law and of human nature tells us that is a breach of law, the failure of law because of the letter and the deficiency of the letter of law, and perennially because of the deficiency of the human nature in acting in violation of the breach of law, there is a constant need to know more of these failures and deficiencies. One can observe with a certain amount of certainty that the bulging volumes of cases, stories, judgments, revisions of rules, etc., or proof enough of the above need. A thing is generally said to be good when it is valuable for some end. Not to misunderstand this term, one should remember that there are three divisions of good, namely a metaphysical good, the goodness of a thing or action which is good in itself, and a physical good, something that is related to con conduciveness and suitability of a thing, or the desirability of a thing, and lastly, a moral good, which applies only to acts of rational beings. Therefore, ethics is essentially concerned with right or wrong. But how do we judge whether an action is right or wrong? There are some indications. 
judging by the consequences of an action for happiness, judging by the principles of universalization, treating persons as hence in themselves. Legal ethics is therefore that branch of moral science which lay down certain duties for observance which an advocate owes to society, to the court, to the profession, to the opponent, to his clients and himself. Legal ethics has therefore become the, uh, I, I, I would uh, probably digressing here for a minute. I remember uh, the uh, well-known uh, professor of government in Harvard, uh, 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 his book on justice, um, Michael Sandel, in his uh, well-known Harvard lectures in justice, begins his lectures in justice to the student with the two important questions. And uh, he talks about the uh, uh, old English case uh, uh, where uh, in, in a standard boat, whether it was human manslaughter or murder to uh, commit cannibalism. Now, he gives two instances of what's called the trolley doctrine. I'll, uh, the trolley doctrine uh, is a very interesting example. He, the first example, the trolley doctrine gives us uh, uh, an interesting dimension of how you look at models, ethics, and, and the complexities of decision making. So, the first example of a trolley doctrine is where there are, the, uh, there are two uh, railroads and they fork at a point. If a trolley was to go at one, uh, one way, there are five workmen who are working and the trolley will, uh, will crash and kill all of them. But if you are in a position to switch the gear and to redirect this trolley to a different track and there you will find only one workman and people are asked whether it is proper and moral for you to switch the gear. A majority of those who were interviewed said only one versus five. Well, yes, you can switch the gear. You are saving lives of five people. Now, in a, a differently worded trolley in an example is uh, where a trolley runs on a track, but you are on a footbridge. The trolley runs on a track beneath, beneath the footbridge. And uh, the, the same thing is likely to happen. Five workmen working, the trolley will have to be stopped. And on the footbridge with you, you have a fat, you know, heavily built person standing on, on the bridge. Then the question is whether if you drop, if you push the fat man from the bridge to down to the tracks, the trolley, he will stop the trolley, but he will be killed. Would it be moral for, for you to push this man down onto the tracks? Many people said no. Look at the difference. So the example of killing one man to one workman to save five workmen and of pushing down one innocent person to save the life of five workmen, the difference in responses is very interesting. So this interest comes in handy in order to understand how professions placed in difficult circumstances of ethical and moral choices in, can potentially reach different conclusions. Therefore, it is important for us to undergo by reflection, by deep reflection on every case we handle and every case we read and every judgment we come across to, to analyze ethical dimensions of the reasoning of the counsel, the reasoning of the judgment, and how a certain moral or ethical conclusion reach in a judgment. So let me go forward with a certain other dimensions I would like to proceed. For instance, uh, uh, Dean Bigmore, one of America's great legal writers once said, he talks about the living spirit of the profession. He says, this living spirit of the profession, which limits, it yet uplifts it as a livelihood has been a customarily known by the vague term legal ethics. An apprentice must hope and expect to make full acquaintance with this body of traditions as his manual of equipment, without which he cannot do his part to keep the law on the level of profession. The term lawyer's allegiance to the legal, ethical values and canons of conduct have been shaped through ages. In everyday conversation, the terms sometimes carry different connotations. When you call lawyers other professions unethical, we usually mean that they have been somehow dishonest, that they lied, cheated, or become involved in a conflict of interest. By contrast, calling a person immoral may conjure up an image of depravity, of cruelty, sexual misconduct, or otherwise illicit behavior. Many of our cases on professional misconduct and other misconduct catch these very important dimensions. Moral philosophers, however, do not generally use the word ethics and morality in these restrictive senses, and they are used interchangeably. That's not, that does not mean that they are always interchangeable. Some theories have reserved the word ethic to refer to the customary norms 
within the society's uh, society's ethos. The term moral, morality, on the other hand, is often used to refer to philosophical system involving abstract universal norms of right and wrong. Immanuel Kant's the famous categorical imperative, quote, act so that you treat humanity always as an end and never as a means only, is an example of such a universal moral principle. The distinct, this distinction between theory-based morality and custom-based ethics suggests a sharp distinction between everyday judgments and philosophical theories. Our disagreements often arise about how to apply broad, shared, broadly shared values or to resolve conflict between them in particular cases. However, much of the controversy surrounding moral issues involves disputes about facts, not principles. The same is true of mostly hotly contested questions of legal ethics. Lawyers disagree about the duty of confidentiality, not because they disagree about the value that are important, but because they disagree about what rules would best serve those values. A basic understanding of the primary frameworks of moral philosophy can sometimes be very helpful in addressing the ethical issues that arise in legal practice. Consequentialism judges the rightness or wrongs of actions based on their consequences. The most familiar consequentialist theory is utilitarianism, primarily developed by Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Sid, Sidwick, etc., etc. However, consequential theories do not need not limit the relevant consequences to pleasure and plan, which are after all hard to measure with any precision. Some economists treat total social wealth as a social as a good to be maximized and judge actions or policies according to economic effects. A third group of theories are generally lumped together under the label virtue ethics. These theories focus on the character of the actor rather than on the nature of the act or the consequences. Aristotle's ethics offers the first systemic expression of approach. He focuses on the character and says the importance of certain key virtues such as honesty, courage, temperance, and most importantly, practical wisdom. For him, virtues enables us to desire good ends and practical wisdom guides us in action that will achieve those good ends. Therefore, we can, the, we can identify a four characteristics of the practice of law. One, law is a public calling which involves a duty to serve the good of the community as a whole. Two, despite the special branches of law we learn to, the profession remains generally of a craft of a generalist. Lawyers perform a wide range of tasks, counseling clients, drafting documents, litigating, and, and then in contemporary times, mediating, which involves moving around or different and wider dimensions of law and beyond law themselves. And, and three, the capacity of a lawyer for a judgment, which is very important. The capacity of a lawyer for a judgment, which means not only intellectual skills, but also development of perceptual and emotional powers. I'll be talking a little later about this by an important author who talks about the feminine aspect of caring in, in the profession. The clever lawyer who possesses a huge stockpile of technical information about the law and is adept at its manipulation, but who lacks the ability to, to distinguish between what is important and what is not, and cannot sympathetically imagine how things look and feel from his adversary's point of view or from a social point of view, I say he is certainly not a lawyer worthy of being commended about. The faculty of judgment means the full complement of emotional, perceptual, and intellectual powers needed for a good judgment. We acquire it over a period of time. And finally, the study and practice of law looks both backwards and forwards. But what we study is a study of the past and the efforts of the present and march towards the future. The four interwoven ethics are conceptions of what lawyer ought to do as seen in lawyer ethical debates and judicial pronouncements are thus that can be encapsulated. You read all of uh, the Council of India rules, you will find again and again 
these principles are you know encapsulated there number one the ideal of a devoted service to clients and a legal system where citizens need advice and representation particularly in an adversarial context two the ideal the ideal of fidelity to law and justice if the system is not to be sabotaged by clients who will anyway would like to advance their interests alone and three an ideal of willingness to work for people and causes that are usually excluded from the legal system this is uh, joseph was talking about uh, the 1987 act then for the ideal of courtesy collegiality and mutual self regulation amongst members of the profession i mean you you will find all these four ideals in every code of conduct and uh, uh, the bar council of india rules like the codes of conduct of the legal profession elsewhere is an excellent compendium of do's and don'ts they seem to contribute to the 10 commandments of the profession a close analysis of the rules of bar council may tell us that uh, they are dealing with many of the above set questions and providing some other uh, some other guidance is that for appropriate to say the general concept of ethics would be a good resource we still need specific set of rules and guidelines to guide the professions who are engaged in her or association with the administration of justice peace and order guarantee of realization of individual potential and meaningful human relationship are perceived to be guaranteed by the idea of a constitution regardless of the fact that they still witness great defects and deficiencies in the working of the idea of a constitution no country and no people would give themselves up to be ruled by unlimited Unstra- unrestrained coercive powers an open society and a constitutional rule are now an indelible part of the human psyche the second aspect is the process of law making and the process of administration of justice have become far more complex the role of a lawyer is not merely that for that of a person called upon to use mere forensic skills in courtrooms and moderate the outcome of adjudication and litigation from this twin aspect one can see that the role of a person equipped to the study of law becomes an activity of in aid and promotion of a just social order at this point of time i would like to bring to focus yet another aspect namely the distinction between professional values and professional virtues i briefly talked about i just talked in this regard and both of which are fundamental to the legal profession professional values can be broadly stated as values are standards influencing choices within courses of action they tend to fall into three or th- one of three groups moral values such as fairness justice and truth pragmatic values such as thrift efficiency and health and aesthetic values such as beauty softness and warmth your value system is a collection of consistent and coherent values ranked according to importance professional value systems include a mixture of moral and pragmatic values as against these professional virtues can be set down in the following words whereas values are standards set by a society or individual virtues are aspirational qualities for individuals professionals aspire to an ideal defining a standard of good conduct virtuous character and a commitment therefore to excellence going beyond the norm of morality ordinarily governing relations among persons if we're going ahead i would like to make an observation that the driving engine behind both professional values and professional virtues can be said to be the empathy and concern for all living beings and perhaps a concern for all creations and fearlessness and courage this empathy has been identified as one of the five domains of emotional intelligence and people express the hope that one day empathy will hold as a valued a place in the curriculum of algebra simply stated empathy is that wonderful capacity all of us have to be able to assess the internal life of another person and equally fearlessness and courage not the power of the bully but the power of a cultivated mind which fears nothing beyond its conscience this brings to a connected question as to what connection professional conduct may have and what responsibility it should have with respect to the institution of justice namely in the context of contempt of court 
and respecting institutions of justice. Case on professional misconduct gives us a glimpse into the how courts take a serious view of any lawyer deviance. The contempt of court uh, has its ancient uh, origins. The story of this law is both informative, sometimes uh, assuring, sometimes disturbing, by reasons of the exercise, the excessive exercise of power. If you pick up Oswald's contempt, in, uh, contempt of court, you will find in the introductory chapter something very worth reading about what a contempt of court could be and need not be. We have articles 129 and 255 providing in respect of contempt of court. The Contempt of Court 1971 is directed gently at all citizens. It aims to ensure that both those who take reasons for the institutions of uh, justice and those who stand outside to evaluate it uh, are subject to this same sweep. Obviously, all parties to the adjudicatory process are to abide by the discipline of Contempt of Courts Act. The need to ensure the dignity and solemnity of uh, the institution of justice is understood to be a fundamental value. That is why undue criticism and ill-suited remarks and statements about the institutions of justice of judges is said to be a matter which will undermine the importance of the court and administration of justice. The duty to the court, the rule of the bar council directly relates more particularly specific duty of the lawyer to act in promotion of the dignity and the value of the court and the judge. Thus, both as a practitioner from inside and a critic and evaluator from outside, the lawyers have a, a very important role to play. The digest of case laws and contempt by advocates gives us uh, varied lessons and how one as a lawyer is called upon to conduct oneself. We have examples of contempt of action against Mahatma Gandhi and other lesser models such as V.C. Mishra. Or recently, as an ex-member of a legislative assembly, from Kerala, namely Mr. Jayarajan, who happened to be an advocate as well. You may look into 2015, 4SCC 81, for about what I'm trying to talk about. From Mahatma Gandhi to Jayarajan, as you draw a canvas of what is a, a contempt of court, freedom of expression on one hand, as valuable as the oxygen we breathe, valuable for ensuring judicial accountability and institutional health and survival. Equally important for ensuring rule of law in a democracy are very sensitive matters which call for extreme devotion to the balancing exercise. The judgments of the Supreme Court in V.C. Mishra, Suras and Jayarajan provide examples for inhaling this very balancing exercise. When you talk about the inhaling ex uh, balancing exercise, we certainly hear about freewheeling discussions about statements made about judicially, judicially improprieties and corruption. That is, that is needless to say, these are matters of extreme concern and calls for institutional reforms of fundamental character. Judicial accountability should not be left to be handled merely by stray voices being raised. When such issues are left to be handled by stray voices, there is every danger of collaboration and cooperation of the dark force of corruption to stifle every possible honest statements and discussions. What is sought to be emphasized by these is that every one of us are given the responsibility to practice with courage and conviction. But the responsibility is not to be reduced to that of a street corner bully carrying country made weapons. The judgment of the Supreme Court in Supreme Court Bar Association or in BD Kaushik is also an example of an association bullying. Bar associations, I think, cannot by mere strength of numbers convert themselves into bodies beyond accountability. The conduct of the lawyer outside the precinct of the court is also not a matter free from regulation to supervision. I give an example. The conduct and becoming of a lawyer can range from acting disrespectfully to a fellow lady advocate. See the judgment in 2015-13 SCC 288. I'd like to quote uh, just a, Mr. Krishan Swami Ayer in his book, in his lectures in the what he says about bench bar relationship. He says, the judge and the practitioner discharge complementary functions in building up the edifice of justice. Their division of duties is merely to secure economy of labor. Look at this very well-placed statement. Their division of duties is merely to secure economy of labor and efficiency of result. 
the efficient administration of justice calls for a full recognition of the identity of vocation. Now, India is the second largest legal profession in the world. We find uh, a larger number of uh, law schools and law colleges turning out a larger number of lawyers every year. Now, when interns come and uh, work with a larger number of uh, lawyers, questions, large, and then very interesting questions come into the minds. What about a legal profession of our future? And what do we learn? And where do we go to practice? And, and how do we really make a good uh, living? These fundamental questions are not answered by textbook reference to legal ethics. And then, as we know, that uh, law curriculum, uh, law schools do not really seriously engage in, in, in uh, practical, clinical understanding of issues of legal ethics and professional ethics. And uh, therefore, a large amount of uh, uh, understanding uh, the dimensions of professional ethics and legal ethics, and uh, what, what are we talking about, namely the care and compassion, the emotional intelligence, professional values and professional virtues, the balancing exercise, all that is seriously missed in while well, students uh, you know, spend their time in law schools. Therefore, and then we also look at intense competition in an unregulated uh, uh, tight market for legal services. And this has encouraged aggressive, hostile, and sometimes a dishonest professional behavior. We seem to be witnessing law students graduating from law schools with uncertain professional goals, values and standards, exposing them to the attractiveness of what one may call hostile and overreaching behavior to achieve professional prestige and material success. Then um, uh, I quote from an article written by Professor Ishita Shengupta who was in NUJ is Calcutta, she quotes an academic called Carol Gilligan. Carol Gilligan proposes a feminist ethic of care as a normative model theory to establish the centrality of care in both the private and public sphere as follows. I quote, theoretically, the distinction between justice and care cuts across the familiar division between thinking and feeling, egoism and altruism, theoretical and practical reasoning. It calls the attention to the fact that all human relationships, both public and private, can be characterized both in terms of attachment and that both inequality and detachment constitute grounds for moral concern. Since everyone is vulnerable both to oppression and to abandonment, two moral wishes, one of justice and one of care recur in human experience. The moral injunctions not to act unfairly towards others and not to turn away from someone in need capture these different concerns. I think, therefore, care cannot be legislated and must emerge from voluntary internal sources. However, what can and should be confronted and, and changed is a legal culture that fosters selfish, profit-maximizing behavior and that minimizes sensitivity towards others and a legal system that allows legal actors to wage war and act in ways which, although ordinarily reprehensible, have become morally defensible in legal practice. We all know that uh, old story of uh, Lord Raham with the famous word whether lawyers are hired guns. And I, in my several uh, question papers uh, for, for advocates and examination, I have repeated this question as to what do you say of the statement that lawyers are hired guns. We need to you know, fundamentally explore this statement because there are several uh, uh, statements about what a lawyer's roles are, and particularly in the context of adversarial system. So therefore, it's important to look at this concept of care. Now, care in lawyering allows legal actors to make ethical choices based on macro considerations such as what ceases to take on or what clients to represent rather than the micro considerations such as what to do in a particular case. I think uh, uh, I'd uh, probably uh, conclude with a few uh, observations. Um, a free market economy. I think today uh, all of us know that uh, we have an open society. Globally, we have a free market economy liberty and freedom of values which are so cherished. All constitutions value these uh, you know, important uh, rights and 
and what is the role of a legal profession therefore in in the context of an open society and a free market economy is it only or are you looking only at the ethos of a, a client or the narrow considerations of a client in a particular context or you would you would probably convert a client controversy into a social issue and a social dimension and then look at from a larger angle of whether you are resolving a social issue and not merely an individual's concern or an interest and therefore in a in a context where a lawyer or a, or a professional is not merely a dispute resolution engineer but something beyond that the dimensions of professional ethics dimensions of professional values the dimensions of professional misconduct take entirely different uh, you know role and understanding now um, probably i'll just conclude uh, uh, by saying that one is what is worrying me in, again in contemporary times we have a uh, an increasing role of lawyers in public interest lawyering now the public interest lawyering has uh, evolved very very important considerations uh, can we say that uh, while lawyers have a role to advance administration of justice by undertaking study evaluations and participations in public interest lawyering whether well we uh, indiscriminately engage in such a public interest lawyering are we uh, closing our eyes to accountabilities in, in certain dimensions when i pick up a certain issue as i think is uh, relevant for a public interest lawyering it is my personal perception of the importance of an issue but when i because there is no particular clientele there may be a group of persons whom i would like to represent but you are not actually representing them in a direct sense before you are picking up a cause for being brought up before a court very often i find the the uh, lawyer's perception of what is just and what is good and what we feel is important for a policy change or policy corrections in governance i think very often you know predominate our mind and i find there is a pitfall there because there is no accountability about my perception my perception is my personal understanding of what is good as a policy correction but then i am not an elected representative so therefore when we pick up issues of public interest where as a lawyering please understand that we need to evolve very important dimensions of professional ethics and accountability in this and that's why you find because we have moved over uh, from from the 1980s when public interest lawyering emerged as a, as a, essentially as a tool in in uh, in aid and assistance of the oppressed sections of the community and to ensure that constitutional rights and fundamental freedoms are made available to them we uh, moved on into a different area of administration of justice governance rule of law good governance so on and so forth therefore i thought yeah, i wanted to flag this issue it's a very controversial dimension and controversial subject but i think it's important for us to look at it more deeply into this aspect now i i think i did not want to go into uh, you know particular case law on but uh, on on professional misconduct but if you look at a scheme uh, before the advocates act came the uh, 1916 bar council of india rules and even before that the courts have not drawn a distinction between uh, other misconduct and professional misconduct so if you draw a line i think uh, uh, a professional can can be personally immoral in the first and life but can still be an able lawyer in an ethically good lawyer but i think i do not know whether we are going to uh, would like to draw these lines very rigidly and then uh, welcome this kind of a distinction but i think it is therefore important that uh, the whatever whatever aspirations we would like to bring in as a as a value added addition to the legal profession would uh, would certainly uh, contribute to converting what is uh, uh, to be called an adversarial legal system uh, and throwing its dark clouds on professional conduct into a a very really and a truly noble profession you know when you enter the law school when you take uh, enroll yourself you are often told this profession is a noble profession but why is it noble from from you know it could be noble for a different reason during roman time if you noble for a different reason than middle ages and in england it will be noble for an entirely different reason in in contemporary time therefore the concept of nobility will also be seen in the in a social context that's why i want to emphasize that notwithstanding the adversarial legal system 
if you are in a position to evolve more glorious rules of conduct by your personal conduct by your personal you know examples i think uh, you would be uh, transforming uh, uh, the very difficult and rigid uh, contours of the uh, adversary legal system into a more flexible and uh, and easily manipulable dimensions i would like to end here and we'll probably look for questions and answers thank you for your attention thank you sir for your brilliant speech and you spoke very well on this topic sir and you have a good command over this topic sir now i have some questions to allow us uh, sir may i uh, ask what are the ethical involved in the use of social media accessing storing use of privileged information by advocates some of interact problem in, involved in its regulation so do you uh, consider it appropriate that there should be a special rules for lawyers in this domain this is joseph would like to answer the question first so you say you are not audible sir yeah yeah now you are audible sir. yeah 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 no. please go ahead i said please go ahead because there is uh, there is something which is uh, touching on what you said now no i think we must look at it from the angle see uh, ever since uh, a professional became an agent of a client confidentiality necessarily came in the breach of a confidentiality is a set to be always a breach of professional ethics so whether it's a client who was a Uh, 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 an interest to be litigated or to be, uh, let's say, lobbied in public. The questions of information which come to you are confidential. But social media has different dimensions. Social media is not is not a, 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 a tool or an instrument uh, which uh, is open to easy definitions and uh, and uh, strict regulations. But as I said earlier, having regard. to the intrinsic nature of an instrument we have evolved we will have to evolve such such tools of regulation that will bear proportionate relevance to the balancing exercise so far we have not undertaken this exercise at all that's why we see whether as a lawyer or as a as a media person or as a or persons engaged in using social media we find unrestrained unregulated used of what one may call the freedom of using freedom of expression or freedom of mind you look at you know after somebody has given a lecture a public lecture or even a talk or even a, a twitter you know thing you will find lots of quick responses to it the kind of language you will see that hugely un unrestrained unregulated probably language you would not like to use even private conversations so therefore the the as much as a media is open a social media is open i think so much is the uh, restraint that is required to in order to exercise your freedom of speech so in due proportion to the extent that you do not exercise vigilant restraint i think the importance of the media itself loses its uh, relevance therefore we are on a, we are slowly on a on a way to uh, diluting the importance of this media it may become it may become a, a street corner uh, bullying exercise therefore from principles of confidentiality which are evolved relating to client and advocate relationship we can still evolve principles of confidentiality in the social media i don't want to get into the recent cases that have triggered certain controversies because of some of my very good friends that call in it and though i have my personal views i think but it's important that regardless of who your friend or foe is it's important that we must now strive towards commonly accepted principles of minimal modes of expression which is good which is relevant which is uh, elevating and which is instructive but the moment we lose this instructive elevating root and relevant you know dimensions we are into other personal 
other personal dimensions which probably probably not ennobling at all thank you very much thank you sir my next question from the uh, lordship the student uh, the professor sir sir one question is from the lucknow swati sir what according to you are the unethical practice that are the bound to affect the high quality and integrity of legal services in supreme court is there a need to strengthen the bar council of india rules in this regard you are asking as an say the the question is uh, from the individual point of view i would say you know if you are to be an honest lawyer according to me your honesty is the most important uh, factor as far as a lawyer is concerned once you have uh, the, the confidence uh, from the court that you are an honest lawyer it has a great value i tell you as a judge uh, having seen from for 18 plus uh, years i tell you it has a great value so uh, the, the the most important quality is the honesty somehow is you are not uh, you are not interested uh, to manage a case you are interested to plead uh, the cause of the the, the litigant that's the most important aspect and if you ask collectively i must say you know even if uh, the regulator goes wrong you should have the courage to say that you are wrong whole problem today is you know uh, if the king is naked nobody is prepared to say you are naked that's one of the problems i think the as a community of uh, this great fraternity is facing now yeah thank you sir so my next question uh, from the ilabad so i asked from the venkat ram sir so in this lockdown due to for uh, poverty if the advocates uh, facing the fin financial crisis and if advocate have taken the temporary jobs like a reviving uh, contracts agreement if few of them have taken a payroll as contract employees as well so will it fall as a violation of ethics a very interesting question suppose you have done it in ordinary times of course it will be breach of your bar council of india rule like uh, in during the lockdown lots of interesting discussions have been going on about uh, you know uh, section 56 of the contract act breach of force majeure and uh, so on and so forth this is as if something which uh, none of us be able to manage has happened to us is one thing to say that uh, at an individual level some people uh, disable themselves from committing and uh, conducting in accordance with law or rules etc but a larger level when something beyond all of us is uh, disabled us so it is not the act of let's say it's not even an act of god in one sense of the term so if a common disability has disabled all of us but then there are different sections of the community the acts is falling on them in different ways it may fall in one sense in one common way it may fall in different sense in different way therefore we here today petition being filed in supreme court by companies saying that we can't pay our employees the petition filed in supreme court saying we don't want to raise a moratorium and you know this uh, proceeding before the insolvency court we filed proceeding for the court you know avoid right raise them like processing that migrant workers on and so forth now that's for if a rule which has to be followed will necessarily lead you let us say to justice or to other in, in, uh, you know imperious consequences then perhaps law will look at it differently and uh, if the doctor of necessity can come in and plead and some occasions when somebody can sit as a judge in one form cause i suppose in very unforeseen and uh, unmanageable situations like this the law will probably relax its rigor and uh, i i remember for myself uh, before i came to practice in supreme court and, and before i shifted to uh, uh, supreme court practice i left my practice and went and joined the a company in kerala to doing tax work uh, there and i forgot virtually i forgot to uh, you know uh, uh, cancel my temporarily my uh, re registration to bar council of tamil nadu it so happened incidentally it happened 
So after six months, when I rejoined the profession, a question came and how I did, did it without informing the Bar Council of India. So I have to give a hundred explanations and then of course it got accepted in a different matter. Why I'm trying to bring this kind of very ordinary example is we are living in, in a situation when lockdown is not merely a consequence of the, the, the exertion of few individuals or a section of a community. I, I think, I think uh, uh, the yes, Bar Council of India rules, the Bar Council of India and perhaps even the court when it is taken to the court to look at it very, very differently. I'll vote in favor of these people who, for reasons of pecuniary reasons, have probably taken an employment. I don't think I'll I'll blame them at all. Uh, thank and you then, so much. I, sir. You could sir. even temporarily uh, give a notice of a temporary suspension also. Is that equally permissible? Sir, my Keep last going. question. Uh, the, uh, Justice Kurian Joseph, you are the role model of whole legal fraternity. So, what is your uh, your message for the young lawyers in this regard? In what regard? If you want to be I, so for young lawyers, so, uh, I'll tell you. Start with uh, this great principle of uh, the. I, we we just learned in our school days. You know, honesty is the best policy. So be honest and be trustworthy. The greatest asset is actually the credibility. If the, the whole world knows that there is a, a lawyer who can be trusted, so, trusted, he will not mislead the court. He will not unnecessarily uh, make uh, noise in court. He is a disciplined lawyer. He is uh, a truthful lawyer. And uh, he will uh, uh, plead for the cause of the person. He will not leave unnecessarily. He will not give uh, uh, what you call uh, un, uh, un, unwanted concessions. He will not uh, leave uh, what you call let the client down. All this are this uh, one way it is you know you say a particular mature lawyer. The other way also the court looks at that whether this fellow is actually giving up his case. Is casual. Is uh, what you call indifferent. He is not prepared or is not uh, uh, confident. But is giving up. This also affects you. So these are in the both ways. You know, you are to be thoroughly prepared, and you know, stand for the cause, and be honest and truthful, be hardworking, be straight, be clear mind, and a clean conscience. If you want those two C's, I started with the three C: casteism, eliminate casteism, communalism, corruption, and the process two C's. Have a clean mind and a clear conscience. I just want to add, said one of my very cherished moments of when you said about uh, uh, being respected. Uh, when I was about six or seven years in the bar, just a in court, I, I argued a matter, and then uh, it's about uh, I think something on uh, railway employee. So when he delivered the order, he dictated the order and then looked at me. And, uh, and said, uh, please look into the judgment and tell us if it needs any corrections or suggestions. I felt so excited about it. And I think I was just about seven, eight years in the bar at that time. And these are these are those these are those uh, you know things which happen in your life when your reputation and reputation for integrity and for values to be followed in the profession become the hallmark of your personality. I think that's what the screen was to be talking about. Yeah, along with this a clear mind and clean conscience. I would also say now my senior used to tell me when I started as a lawyer. Uh, this is you know you, the, the level of argument should be that you know after having argued a case, you should not have a feeling that I could have argued something more. I could have argued better. So you must have that that exhaustive approach. That you know, your conscience should not tell later that I could have done better, I could have argued better, I could have researched that more. Do it so thoroughly and so have a commitment. This is a 24 into 7 profession. I tell you, 24 into 7 profession. Be a lawyer, 24 into 7. Be an honest lawyer, good lawyer, great lawyer. All the best. Uh, definitely, sir. Uh, Justice Queen, you are the gem of our bench. 
and our wing termination you are the gem of our bar so we are following your footprints and uh, so uh, in, 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 during this lockdown we had conducted the uh, uh, 20 webinars on the different topics and with eminent speakers so now may i request to aljo k joseph kindly give your vote of thanks in respect of our guest good evening all good evening just speaking joseph uh, mr vengatamni senior advocate uh, mr vikas mr vinod and uh, mr sunil indeed it's my pleasure to address all of you in this uh, you know difficult times everyone knows that we are running through a difficult situation of covid lockdown especially uh, sir the legal profession is actually facing huge crisis uh, the third question which vikas asked to you sir it is very important as of today because if any person goes out and do some other practice or do some other profession because i was actually felt very bad when i saw a news in times of india other day that uh, a gentleman a lawyer a young lawyer who is having 3 4 years of practice was put in 3 4 years of practice has started his family job like waving off you know uh, baskets uh, he has gone back to survive so this situation is actually in existence you know many of the young lawyers in this country are struggling as a member executive of uh, supreme court advocate on record association sir we are trying to uh, i have i i want to inform everyone that we are trying to help as much as lawyers possible by giving financial assistance like 10000 rupees as exclusive and we are now going to give one more installment those who are applied that's 5000 more so we are collecting money from many senior advocates uh, many of our uh, you know legends uh, legends from the bar are uh, you know contributing a lot so we are trying to help people as much as possible in such kind of a difficult time and uh, like honestly uh, asking me whether the professional ethics at this juncture you no know, stops you from working or you are not getting cases and you wanted to survey so uh, it is very difficult you uh, know it is very difficult to survey in such kind of a situation and i don't i don't blame any lawyer if he is taking up some other employment in this sir you are uh, just kurian joseph sir your words were so encouraging for us a law man of the country we have to lead from the front like you said sir every lawyer is now trying to do that and i personally wanted to thank you for you know your efforts and your contributions to the society as a human being as a lawyer as a judge so you know, as a as a as a person the contributions you have done for the society during this pandemic period you've been actively doing many social works and you've been actively helping people especially migrant laborers people stuck in different places across the country and trying to help them and reaching out to people giving food distributing many things i personally thank you you know from my side also on behalf of the organization for doing all all the uh, all the works and social commitment activities so in addition to that today's webinar and your advices are really good for uh, you know all the young lawyers of this country i i thank you on my behalf as well as and i thank you for the uh, on behalf of the all india lawyers forum uh mr vengat ramni uh, he is he is my beloved senior i i practiced with him for almost 5 years as his office junior uh, i learned all the professional ethics and law from him from his face so he is my guru in all sense and uh, i can honestly tell to all the viewers that he is the master in the subject i i happened to attend almost uh, like 8 9 lectures he has given for the you uh, know the aor training programs has been conducted by supreme court every year before the exam so i happened to attend and i had an occasion to assist him in preparing many things over you know many years so i thank you sir for your you know encouraging speech and uh, you know the the enlightening words of yours uh mr vinod uh, he's a dynamic personality he is leading you know more than 10000 people and under this forum and trying to reach out to many of the people many of the young lawyers and lawyers of this country with his enthusiasm and energy and giving them lot of lectures uh, using the eminent personalities eminent legal personalities of this country i personally thank mr vinod also for taking uh, using this as uh, the pandemic period and uh, making the time so fruitful 
Mr. Vikas, Vikas is a dear friend actually. He is a very dear friend of mine. Vikas is also contributing his bit, you know, towards uh, you know, supporting the organization as well as Mr. Vinod in reaching out to maximum number of people. Uh, he was the ex additional advocate general for state of Haryana. Irrespective of that, he is uh, practicing. He is a colleague of me in Supreme Court. I thank Mr. Vikas and uh, you know, such a wonderful Vikas. People are doing a wonderful job, and you are reaching out to the maximum number of people. Even people in Kerala are watching it. You, you can trust me for that. I know personal calls, and I forwarded your things because eminent. You are bringing up with eminent personality. So I I forwarded the messages to many of the uh, you know friends in Kerala also, and many of them are very happy with the lecturers because you are coming with very eminent personality. So I thank All India Lawyers Forum for conducting and. I, your team also. I, I should not forget your team. Your team is also doing a wonderful job. So I thank All India Lawyers Forum and your team for making these events and the, making the pandemic period, lockdown period, a fruitful and at least reaching out to the maximum number of lawyers and encouraging them to continue with the profession. I thank you once again, all of you, sir, and wishing you a good day. I That's just want to say, uh, thank Mr. Vikram, uh, just one second. Mr. Vengadamani, yes. I just want to ask you, sir, in the drafting, there's one paper for drafting, no? Yes, yes. 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 Why, uh, why, why don't we permit uh, the young lawyers uh, to use their laptops also to the we are, try we to draft? Are, we, are, we, are, we are thinking on those lines. Because yeah, because I, sir, I, this is handwriting now, because everybody, the, the process of thinking and writing is with the speed. Yes. So we are ask them. Because all of them are now we're quite familiar with the new gadgets you now, so I think th this should also be permitted. You can block the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, so they will not Google out. Don't worry. One, one, one profitable outcome can be that you don't have to look at all kinds of handwriting as an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great advantage for <laughs> valuing also. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, sir, when I when exactly. I have to correct uh, answer sheets, uh, you have to of course grapple with uh, different uh, you know handwritings. And then it's a painful job to give a lesser mark for a not so good handwriting. It's always a painful job. But I think this yeah, we, are thinking, you, we are looking into it. I think that will come very soon. Very good. Thank you. Sir, before ending this okay. session, I would like to mention some office visits from the different parts. Sir, uh, we have connected with the 23 states. Uh, Dipesh Nirala, state president from the Jharkhand. Durgesh Gupta from the Maharashtra. Udit Mendiratta from the Haryana, Vikram Ji Jatana from the Punjab, Karanjit Jindal, and uh, Preeti Shrohi from the UP, Saurabh Sharma from UP, Manvinder Singh, Social Media Coordinator, uh, Bhagya Shri Mishra, uh, Gujarat, Bashir Advocate from the Kerala, RM Jadhav from the Karnataka, uh, Jahirika from the Assam, Farooq Sofi from the JNK and Ishad no, Ahmed from the Karnataka. And sir, uh, uh, Pragya Parijat Singh, who, she is our foreign coordinator. And Shweta Bajaj, who is uh, our academic coordinator. And Suvir Sidhu, who is also national coordinator. And Abhinav Singh is president. And Rod Kumar Goel, chairman. And all the team efforts are made uh, uh, with your blessings. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And at the end of uh, this uh, beautiful session, I just mentioned one thing that the Lawyers Forum, our All India Lawyers Forum and our team is always available for the, our law students, law professors and the legal fraternity members. Even we are available for the whole persons of the country who are in need of any justice. So we are uh, here for the pro bono cases, always be ready our team for uh, help of our every man of the country. So uh, don't hesitate, please mail us or the contact us through our the team members. We are always our for the nations. Thank you.